Welcome again to our Bible study tonight. So we are going back to the book of Matthew 27. Now, we did start this study in the month of May, um, but in between then and now, um, we had um, a period of prayer and fasting. And because of the prayers, we had to postpone our Bible study. So I will start tonight by giving us a brief recap of some of what we have already discussed. And if you missed it, just feel free to go back into your Bible and just read again um, Matthew 27 from verses 1 to 26, because I'm not going to read those verses tonight, but I will bring out some of the points that we discussed when we were looking at that first section. But tonight I will be concentrating really from um, verse 27 up to the end of the chapter, which is verse 66. So we are back in this very um, crucial chapter where we are looking at um, the betrayal of the Lord Jesus, the, the trial, the crucifixion as well, um, and all the circumstances that surrounded it. And as usual, you know, I'm asking you to not just listen to what I'm saying, but to prayerfully um, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying so that at the end of my presentation, we might all be in a position to contribute something because Holy Spirit always interprets the word of God for us. And I know that he'll be speaking to all of us. So please be attentive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit so we can all benefit from what we will share together and also for the prayers that we're going to be taking at the end of the session. So like I said, I'll just give us um, a brief recap of verses 1 to 26, but I will not read the scriptures from those verses. Please do go back and read them in your own time. So when the chapter opens, um, Matthew 27, it starts off with um, Judas Iscariot um, being remorseful for the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the chapter starts, we see Judas going back to the chief priests um, in the temple and seeking to give them back the money that they had used to bribe him to betray the Lord. And obviously, when he goes back to them, these men were so hardened. They did not want to have any part of it. They weren't interested in his remorse or the fact that he was feeling bad. And so he ended up having to throw um, the, the 30 pieces of silver into the, 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 the church because the, the chief priest wouldn't receive it from him. So he threw the money on the ground and he left. Um, and we discussed then when we were looking at this, that remorse is not equivalent to repentance. Just because somebody feels bad about something they have done that maybe has hurt their loved ones or hurt their friends or hurt their brothers and sisters in Christ, just because you're remorseful doesn't mean that you have repented. So repentance is a complete about turn. It means that you were going down a certain specific pathway that is displeasing to God. And then you come to the realization of the fact that what you have done is displeasing to God. And then at that point, you surrender to him, to his grace, to his help, and you give up your sin and you make an about turn. So in the case of Judas, he felt bad. He was convicted of his sin, but he didn't repent. He didn't go back to the Lord. He didn't go to God. He just kept that um, feeling of guilt. And of course, it destroyed him because guilt that is not leading to repentance destroys. We compared it with um, the scenario of the disciple and apostle Peter, how that Peter betrayed the Lord Jesus in his own way by denying him three times before the cock crowed. However, he then felt bad about his actions when the word of the Lord had come to pass. And in that, his godly sorrow, he was able to go back to God. And we see how much he was used by the Lord in the early church. We also talked about how um, 
the money that Judas had used to, um, sorry, had received, the money that attempted him to betray his Lord wasn't really that much money. Yes, it was a lot of money. Um, the Dakes Bible estimates it could have been equivalent to 113 days wages of a laborer. So not even half a year as such. That's what he used to betray his Lord. And when you compare the value of what he got and what then happened to him, you can see that it's not comparable. There is nothing worth giving up Jesus for. Now, when Judas um, threw back that money into the temple, we see that the religious leaders, um, they themselves described that money as blood money. And they said, it's not right to put this blood money back into the temple treasury. And instead, they used it to go and purchase um, a field where maybe homeless people and strangers and refugees who died could be buried into. And we can see the level of hypocrisy here that these men understood that this was blood money and they understood that blood money would defile the temple offerings. And yet they couldn't repent. Their hearts were hardened. They were receiving and exchanging blood money but they were not repentant. Instead, they were excusing the inexcusable. And it's a, it's a lesson to us today that, you know, at the hint of hypocrisy, don't let it go forward because you might harden your heart to the point where you start to do unthinkable things, things that you know are wrong, but are persisting in them. Or you might be so interested in cover up in how you appear to people and end up covering up things that ought not to be covered up. So we learned that from the account of Judas. The other thing we saw the cost of the betrayal. Um, he ended up um, committing suicide, dying, death by hanging, um, but also um, some Bible um, uh, historians are saying that possibly when he had hung himself because it committed suicide. And in those days, people did not uh, give a proper burial to somebody who died by suicide. So they took his body and threw it uh, over a cliff into the Valley of Hinnom. And as they did that, the body that was already becoming distended, maybe from the heat and everything, as he fell, um, his bowels burst open and, and that was the horrific end um, that Judas came to simply because of betraying the Lord Jesus. So there's a, a high cost to um, betraying our Lord. In, in our days today, that betrayal might not necessarily be receiving money, but it could be when we are denying the Lord or we are denying um, the faith in the way that we live our lifestyles. And again, it's a warning for us to go back to God and go back and submit ourselves under the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, what did we learn um, the last time we were together? We, we saw the trial of the Lord Jesus and how he never defended himself. And this fulfilled some of the prophecies that had been given about him in the book of Isaiah. When we look at Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, we see all those prophetic words coming to pass. He was led like a, a, a lamb to the slaughter and he never opened his mouth to defend himself. And we spoke about how Christ knew um, that these people's hearts had been taken over by Satan. They were so hardened that it would have been useless to respond to the accusations. And even Pilate, who was presiding over the trial, the Bible says in Matthew 27, um, verse 17, he was asking them, you know, this is the time of the year when I can release one prisoner to you. Shall I release Jesus? Or who hasn't really done anything? He hasn't done anything evil. He's only done good things. Shall I release him? You know, let's release him and put an end to this sham trial. Um, or shall I release Barabbas, a notorious criminal? And these people chose the release of a notorious criminal. They were not worried about where Barabbas was going to go within their local community and what sort of atrocities he was going to commit because this was a hardened criminal with a record of doing criminal activity. But the people, the religious leaders, the Bible records in verse 18 that they were so envious of the Lord Jesus that even Pilate himself knew that they had brought Jesus to this trial simply out of envy. And for us, again, it's another lesson on the power of certain um, negative emotions where we 
allow ourselves to entertain envy or jealousy or any such thing. It can literally lead to murder um, because at some point when a person is consumed with envy, is consumed with jealousy, they will seek to kill the person that they're envious of. And this was the case. The chief priests were envious of the Lord. They were envious of the authority with which he taught the word of God. They were envious of the miracles, the signs and the wonders. And because of that, they chose to kill him. And so it is a warning to us today, even in the body of Christ. Remember, these religious leaders were not some unbelievers out there outside the church of God. These were people who were familiar with the scriptures. They were inside what we would say today is the household of faith, the house of God. And yet they were in the house of God and were not led by God. They did not understand God, but were led by evil emotions such as envy and jealousy. So our prayer today is that God would uproot such emotions from us and that we would be people who are content with what the Lord has given to us. Again, from Matthew uh, verses 1 to 26, we encountered the wife of Pilate, whom um, history records as being called Claudia. We found out that Claudia, um, who wasn't a religious leader or a chief priest or anything, was able to receive a divine warning about the identity of the Lord Jesus, whereas the chief priest didn't receive any. In verse 20, we see the chief priests and the elders prevailing over the crowds to request for the release of Barabbas and crucify an innocent man. Yet this woman who we might class as an unbeliever was able to have a dream about the Lord Jesus and respect and respond to the dream. She was able to come and warn her husband and say, please have nothing to do with that holy man because I've had some tormenting dreams about him, have nothing to do with that holy man. An unbeliever could notice that Jesus was a holy man when the religious people couldn't recognize this. And this is an important lesson for us. It is a sad day when people outside the church are able to receive godly direction, are able to respond to messages from God when the people in the household of faith are not hearing anything. They're not dreaming any dream. They're not seeing any vision. That is an indictment against the church. And my prayer tonight is that we would be receptive to the Holy Spirit. And when the Lord warns us, we would respond to the warnings. When the Lord gives you a dream, that is a warning. We would not ignore it, but we would act upon the warning. Just like this woman, this woman was moved and she didn't allow her husband to just go in blindly. She warned him as well. And he treaded with caution, you know. Um, and then finally, the last time we were here um, in the book of Matthew 27, we talked about these uh, last two verses from the last week, Matthew 27, 25 and 26, that when Pilate, because of the warning of his wife, said to these people, if you want Barabbas to be released and you want to carry on with crucifying um, this Jesus, I don't want to be a part of it. I am washing my hands over the death of this innocent man. He responded to his wife's warning and he washed his hands off it. And then all those Jewish people, they shouted in verse 25 and 26 and said, let his blood be on them and on their children. And so Pilate released Barabbas and whipped and delivered Jesus up for crucifixion. And we spoke about this, that we must be very careful about the words we speak, because there are certain words that we speak that become word curses. And in this case, when they said, let the blood of Jesus be on their heads, they didn't just stop there. They also said on their children. And you and I know historically how much persecution the Jewish nation has faced historically. We know about what Hitler and the Nazis did and when they attempted to exterminate the Jews and put them through serious, severe torture and torment. We, we've all heard about the gas chambers. We've watched documentaries. We've read history books about the horrors people went through. And could that be traced back to these words of let the blood of Jesus, um, the, the judgment and the guilt of it be on their heads and the heads of their children. There are word curses that sometimes you speak something and you think that you're just talking, but those words become a curse over your family and over your children and your children's children. May God help us to guard our words and any words that we've spoken that would stand as word curses. May the blood of Jesus nullify them.
We see the same thing in, in the Old Testament and Genesis with um, the, 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 the wife of Isaac, uh, who was the mother of Jacob. When Jacob no longer wanted to deceive his father Isaac and was saying, mom, okay, if I go ahead with this plot of yours to pretend that I'm Esau, what if my dad finds me out and then releases a curse on me rather than the blessing, the birthright? What will become of me? And his mother at the time said, no, Jacob, don't worry. Let the curse be on my own head, my son. She took the curse and no wonder she died before her time. So anytime we speak certain words, let's be careful that those words are not standing against us. So having said that, I hope um, I've brought you up to speed with what we did um, two weeks ago. Let's go ahead now and continue our Bible study from verses 27 to 66. So if you have your Bible with you, you can please read along with me. Um, Matthew 27 from verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. Please take note of that. Jesus had a whole Roman cohort around him. There was not just one soldier. There was not just two soldiers. He had a Roman cohort all around him. And this could have been up to 80 men, up to 80 soldiers surrounding him. Could have been, uh, you know, 80 people just assigned to beat him up. When I was reflecting on this today, I thought about how many times have we taken um, the crucifixion for granted. It's a sobering thought. How many times have we taken lightly the price that Jesus paid for our salvation. How must the Lord Jesus feel sometimes when he looks at us, the church, the body of Christ, when we act as if he died for nothing or we act as if his death, you know, was something we can just take lightly. Look at this verse 27. Jesus had a whole Roman cohort around him, up to 80 soldiers just to beat him up. They stripped him. They put a scarlet robe on him, and that was mockery, taking off his clothes. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, put a reed in his right hand, you know, and said, you say you're a king. You know, we're going to pretend with you. We're going to play a game, play a game of kings with the crown of thorns. And historians tell us that that crown of thorns was not made of little tiny thorns like what you would think. These were literally long thorns, maybe six to 12 inches long, these thorns. And when they put them on his head, they didn't just put them lightly, they pressed them down so that he was bleeding from his scalp, from his face, where the thorns were digging into his skin. He did all that so that you and I would get the mind of Christ. How painful must it be for our Lord Jesus when up to now we don't have the mind of Christ? When up to now we think thoughts that are not consistent with his word. We entertain things that are not consistent with the word of God. Crown of thorns. He bled from there. And then the Bible says they started to kneel before him in mockery. They ridiculed him saying, hail, rejoice, king of the Jews. They spat on him. Now, I don't know if you've ever been spat on, but having somebody spit at you is sort of the height of disrespect. When somebody spits at you, it's they are calling you the lowest of the law and they're saying, you know what? You're under my feet. I don't respect you. You disgust me. I look down on you. I despise you. And if you've ever been spat on, you will know how horrific it is. Human spit, it smells. It's something that you don't want anywhere near your face. Remember, the Lord was tied up at this time. He couldn't dodge the spit. And God knows how many of them spat on him. If he had a whole cohort around him, he was covered in their spit. You and I today, we get offended by little things. Maybe somebody didn't greet you the way you like. They didn't look at you the way you like. And then we get offended and say, who do they think they are? 
who do they think they are? Do they know who they are talking to? But this was the king of kings and the Lord of lords who was treated in this manner. He was spat on. Think about this child of God. The one who is the word that the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the same was with God from the beginning and there was nothing that was made that was not made through the word. Jesus is the originator of creation. We were created through him because he's the word. But now imagine the beings that he created, the beings that he was even dying for. Because at this point, Jesus was going through this even for those Roman soldiers who were spitting on him. Let's think about that. They spat on him. They took the reed and they struck him repeatedly on the head. These were soldiers. They were not just uh, joking around with the hitting. This was proper assault. After they finished ridiculing him, they stripped him of the scarlet robe, put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. This is some of the pain that our Lord Jesus went through for you and I. How must our hearts respond to what he went through? When I even think about, try to imagine the scene, your clothes have been taken off and people are whipping your skin. How that must have been excruciatingly painful. Today, if you and I just trap our finger in the door, we feel like we're so overwhelmed with pain, we have to run to the GPs, the A&E, and get all sorts of medication. But our Lord went through a lot of suffering without any medication, without any pain relief for you and I. How much must we respond to the price he paid? Verse 32 of Matthew 27. Now, as they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they forced into the service to carry the cross of Jesus. And we'll come back um, to um, si Simon of Cyrene, but we can see that this cross was not a light implement. It was heavy. This is a man they have starved. They have beaten up. They have exhausted. He's in pain. And then he's supposed to carry the cross up a hill. He couldn't do it anymore. So they inscripted Simon of Cyrene. To the people at the time, it must have looked that Simon was very unfortunate. If it was our time, they'd say, oh my word, what's he done to deserve this? But actually he had that great honor and the privilege of lightening the load of our master. I can only imagine the reward that Simon of Cyrene would have received. It makes me wonder today in our time, how much am I willing to surrender my own comfort for the things of God? What is that weight that I'm willing to take upon myself for his kingdom? Because he suffered so much for us. Simon of Cyrene played his role by carrying that cross. Jesus said, if any man should follow me, he must first of all deny himself and then daily take up his cross and follow me. He said daily. We can't say, I'm going to just do it once a year or maybe in January when I'm making New Year's resolutions. Every day, I must be willing to take up the cross and follow him, whatever that might be. And the Bible says in verse 33, they came to a place called Golgotha, which was called the place of a skull. And they offered Jesus wine mixed with gall, you know, a bitter tasting drug that they offered him. Perhaps they were now feeling sorry for him. But he refused to drink it after he tasted it. He just went through it all without the help of any drug or anything like that. Verse 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes amongst themselves by casting lots. We'll come back to this verse because this was a fulfillment of prophecy. Then sitting down there, they began to keep watch over him. They guarded him in case he might attempt any rescue um, mission or in case anybody tried to take him down. And above his head, they put the accusation against him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. Unbeknownst to them, they were actually prophesying his correct title. He is the king of the Jews. He is the king of the world. He is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. Verse 38, at the same time, Two robbers were crucified with Jesus, one on the right and one on the left. And again, we'll come back to these robbers because this was a, a, a fulfillment of prophecy. 
Now, please note verse 39 and 40 that I'm about to read now, if you're following in your Bibles. Matthew 27, 39. Those who passed by were hurling abuse at Jesus and jeering at him, wagging their heads, going, oh, they said tauntingly, you who said you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, save yourself from death. If you are indeed the son of God, come down from the cross. This was the mockery. And remember, these were the people that Jesus was dying for in the same way as us. And they lacked understanding. On top of the pain of the physical beatings, Jesus suffered the pain of psychological abuse, of trauma, of betrayal in every way. These were the same people that he fed the 5,000, fed the 4,000, healed their sick, raised their dead. And yet they walked past his cross taunting him and mocking him. You and I must think about it carefully today with the price the Lord Jesus has paid for us. Does our lifestyle mock his death and resurrection? Does the way we live mock what he has done? By the way we live, are we saying what he did didn't matter? We have to continually think about this, keep the cross in the front of our minds. In verse 41, it says, in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, mocked him, saying, he saved others from death. He resurrected Lazarus, didn't he? He resurrected the widow woman of Nain's son, didn't he? How come he cannot save himself? Isn't he the king of Israel? He's king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him and acknowledge him. And I'll come back to this verse again, when they were saying, if he comes down, we will believe in him and acknowledge him because you know, that was a big lie. Verse 43, they said, he trusts in God, doesn't he? Let God rescue him now, if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who had been crucified with him also began to insult him in the same way. Jesus faced a lot of insult. I'm not sure you and I, could ever face the same kind of insult because none of us is, is God. None of us is the son of God. None of us has led a perfect, pure life. But this son of God had led a pure life, a life of holiness. He had never sinned against any of these people. And yet they were insulting him. And these were the people he was dying for. Let's continue to verse 45. It says, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. So from... 12 noon to 3 p.m., there was darkness. And at about 3 p.m., Jesus cried out with a loud, agonized voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabagatani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at this point, Jesus was carrying the weight of our sins. Father God cannot dwell in the midst of sin. Father had to look away from his son. Father, at that point, the close fellowship that God the Father and God the Son had and God the Holy Spirit, that fellowship had to be pulled back. And the Lord Jesus now stood alone carrying the weight of our sins because sin is an abomination to God. Sin separates people from the presence of God. As soon as Jesus carried our cross on that, sorry, carried our sins on that cross, that sin separated him from fellowship with the Father. When some of the bystanders there heard it, they began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, soaked it with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him from death. So they were still being horrific, scornful and doubting. Verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud, agonized voice and gave up his spirit. Remember, the Lord Jesus said, nobody is taking his life from him, that he voluntarily lays it down. So he voluntarily, sovereignly released his spirit from his body to submit to the plan of the Father for us human humanity. The plan to redeem humanity required a sinless sacrifice to die in our place. And he couldn't die as God. He couldn't die in his divinity. He had to lay aside his majesty, lay aside his divine power and become an ordinary human being. 
And at this point, he was just like me and you, physically speaking. However, when he had carried our sin, because the wages of sin is death, Jesus had to die our death so that you and I today could live his life and in forgiveness. When he died, he paid that price where it says, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. So when Jesus died for us, he paid the price. And that price has given us salvation. He says, and at once, at the point Jesus gave up his spirit when he died, the veil of the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem was torn in two from top to bottom. The veil in the Holy of Holies in heaven was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split apart. And this was very um, significant because previously the Holy of Holies could not just be approached. Even on planet earth, the high priest could only go in once a year after having given a lot of sacrifice for himself and for the people he represented. Could only go in once a year. And we're told that even when he went in, they would tie a rope around him. He'd have to go in alone after much purification rites. And then in there, anything could happen. If he wasn't cleansed properly, he could literally die there. So what the people outside would do is they would wait for him to come out. If he went for ages and there was no return, they would have to tug on that rope. If there was no resistance on it, they would have to drag him out because you could die literally from encountering the holiness of God in your sin. So access to the Holy of Holies, we must never take it for granted. It is the highest promotion that Jesus has given us by his crucifixion. We no longer need an in-between. Through Christ Jesus, we go directly into the Holy of Holies by his blood. The Bible says in Hebrews, he has opened up a new and living way for us. There is a, a, a way, a road that has been opened for us into the Holy of Holies by his body that was broken for us. We now have access to the Father, to God be all the glory. And then in verse 52, it says the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep in death were raised to life. That's resurrection power. And we talked at length about this verse when we're looking at the teachings around, um, you know, the resurrection and the second coming and all that. This was a sign that you and I someday, if Jesus tarries and we, 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 we live a long life and die, this, this is one of the reasons why we can be hopeful that there is a resurrection. Because the power of God hit those tombs and brought them out. They came out of the tombs, they entered Jerusalem and appeared to many people. Now, the centurion and those who were with Jesus, keeping guard over him, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, they were terribly frightened and filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. Notice this, not the chief priests, but the soldiers who didn't really know God that much. They were the ones, these were Roman soldiers who had been assigned to guard Jesus. When they saw the signs accompanying his death, they immediately understood that this was indeed the son of God and they were terribly frightened. They were filled with awe. And verse 55 says, there were also many women who were looking on from a distance who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and Salome and the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John. We know these women were following from a distance because of that fear of what would happen to them if they were too closely associated with Jesus. But you can see the love that they had for the master and they were willing to stay and hang around and see what was happening. Verse 57 to 61, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus so that he might bury him. And Pilate ordered that it be given to him. And Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb. Again, we'll come back to this because this was fulfillment of prophecy. Um, he rolled a large stone over the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary. So these women carried on their vigil, watching over the Lord Jesus. Now, I mentioned before that the Roman soldiers, when they saw the signs accompanying the death of Jesus, even without knowing the scriptures, they came to the realization that this was indeed the son of God. How is it that the chief priests could not see that? and they couldn't repent 
you will now see that the same thing that happened to them happens today in our time. When people refuse to follow the ways of God, it's not because they haven't got the evidence that God is God and that Jesus is the King of Kings. No, at the root of unbelief is not just the hatred of God, but it's also the love of one's own sin. These chief priests loved their lifestyle of greed, of covetousness, of, of using the title of priest to enrich themselves and to big themselves up and to walk in pride. All the evidence in the world isn't enough to persuade those who love their sin to give it up and submit to God. You know, they wickedly asked Pilate to get Jesus beaten up. Look at Matthew 27, 42. They now insulted him and said, if he's the king, let him save himself. They were doing all this to a man they knew was innocent. If they didn't know he was innocent, they wouldn't have needed to bribe Judas. And, and ask him to betray the Lord Jesus. They knew this. They wouldn't have needed to ask people to tell lies. So they knew he was innocent, but they hardened their hearts. They said, well, if he's the son of God, let him come down from the cross. If he comes down right now, we will believe that is God. And you know what? That's a lie. If Jesus had miraculously freed himself from the nails, they still wouldn't believe. Because when they heard next uh, week when um, we are led through Matthew 28 by the teacher who will take us through next week, you will find out that when they heard that Jesus had resurrected and the tomb was empty, they did not fall down in fear and repentance and say, oh, Father Lord, have mercy on us. We've made a mistake. No, rather they bribed the guards to spread a false story so that people would not come to know the truth about the resurrection. And that false story persists up to today where some people say his disciples stole his body. So what I'm saying here is that no matter the evidence that is there that God exists, it is not evidence that changes the mind of the unbeliever. It is the fact that people love their sin. If you don't hate your sin, you are not going to repent. So what we learn here, number one, is that our fallen human heart is far harder than we imagine. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? Unless you've been redeemed, the human heart is hard. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 18 to 19, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, they have become callous having given themselves over to sensuality and to practice every kind of impurity with greed. Human beings are able to do this, to harden their hearts. And once they do this, nobody can convince them. My prayer is that you and I will not harden our hearts. Look at it here. The fallen human heart was able to reject and crucify a sinless savior. They knew Jesus has not done anything to offend them, has not done anything evil, yet they were happy to see him beaten up. He was beaten up beyond recognition. And even that did not satisfy them. What they wanted was for him to be killed. They kept asking, crucify him. And that shows you, even up to today, some people can stand against an honest person, a truthful person, and still want to cause them harm because of the hardness of the heart. May God deliver us from hardness of heart. Anytime you find yourself starting to ignore the word of God, let us remind ourselves that this hardness of heart, it always ends badly and it will end in, in eternal punishment in hell. May God deliver us. These people were so cruel. Seeing Jesus being beaten did not, did not affect them. They didn't feel bad. Imagine knowing an innocent person is innocent, seeing them covered in blood, and it didn't bother you. That's what happened to these people. They were so hard that they were willing to suppress the clear evidence that Jesus is Lord. And in our day and time, there are still some people like that. They do podcasts. They do um, YouTube videos, Facebook Live, Instagram Live all to oppose the gospel. Yet, there was a lot of evidence. For example, the chief priests, all of them had read Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 chillingly describes the, the crucifixion of Jesus. It even prophesies the cry of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's there in Psalm 27, 46. 
When they saw that the veil of the temple being torn, the earthquake, that should have reminded them of the word of God. Psalm 22, Psalm 27 mentioned all these things. They knew these things, but yet they hardened their hearts. Like now today, there are many people in church. They attend Bible study. They've been in church all their lives, but they've hardened their hearts. The teaching is bouncing off their hearts. That's why every time I start Bible study, I always pray and say, Lord, let my heart be fertile ground so that your word can land. Lord, please prepare my heart. Don't let me harden my heart so that when the word is coming, I'm not listening. I'm not heeding it. So the real reason people reject Jesus is not because there's a lack of evidence, but rather they don't want to submit their lives to the king of kings and the lion of the tribe of Judah. We look at the man, Joseph of Arimathea, who requested for the body of Jesus to bury him. We see that in verses 57 to 60. He's coming forward and asking to bury Jesus should have triggered the minds of the Jewish people and the chief priests. Because Isaiah 53, 9 says, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with the rich men in his death. Jesus was crucified with two criminals, yet he was buried in the rich man's tomb. The Jewish leaders who knew Isaiah 53 off by heart, at this point, they should have repented and believed in Jesus rather than bribing the guards. I was, as I was doing the, the reading around Matthew 27, I came across this story where um, a, a teacher called Cliff um, had a conversation with the university student who was claiming that the Bible was packed with mythology, you know, fables and fairy tales, even though he said he'd never read it. So Cliff asked him, challenged him to read um, both the book of Isaiah, which contains prophecies about Christ, and to read Matthew which records the fulfillment of the predictions. And then the next day, this young person came and said, I have read Isaiah and I've read Matthew and said, it was interesting literature. I think it speaks the truth. So Cliff said, that's great. Are you now ready to trust Christ for eternal life? And the student said, no way. I have a very active sex life. I know that Christ would want to change that. And I don't want anyone to change that. And when I read this, I thought that's exactly how some of our young people are. They know Jesus, but they love their sinful lifestyle. I love sleeping with my girlfriend that I'm not married to. I love doing this. I love clubbing. Jesus might want to change my lifestyle and tell me to be pure and tell me to wait till I'm married. And I don't want to do that. Some people are stealing. They are thieves. Jesus might tell me to stop being a crook, might tell me to stop internet fraud. So I don't want to do that. So I want to carry on with my sin. You know, our prayer is that when we encounter the word of God, may we not harden our hearts. May we not like our sin and love our sin more than we love this savior who went through this excruciatingly painful, embarrassing, shameful death for us today to give us victory over Satan. None of us can ever be victims of Satan once we give our lives to Christ. God has made that provision for us, but we will never be victorious over sin without Jesus. No matter how good you are, your heart will still sin. And the standard of God is very high. It's more than just what you say. It's about what your heart is saying. Many people are good at covering up or feeling self-righteous, but the only righteous standard is through Jesus. We can never attain the standard unless we put our faith in Jesus. May God help us not to be like this student. If anyone thinks they have intellectual reasons for doubting the truth of Jesus and his death and resurrection, they must actually admit the truth that the reason they are doubting is because they don't want to give up their sin. They love their sin. And we believers of today, we mustn't feel proud when we read about these chief priests and think, oh, can't imagine why these people could be so wicked. Because if you're not careful, your own heart might be harder than you imagine. Let's look at the disciples, for example. In this chapter, as we've been going through the pain Jesus was going through, we see the women, but we don't see Peter. We don't see um, the other disciples. We don't see Tedious. We don't see, you know, Nathaniel. We don't hear about them. They are absent from here. Why? Because they were hiding, protecting their own lives. Jesus said, whoever tries to preserve their own life, they're going to lose it. But whoever gives up their life for me, he says, you will get eternal life. 
So we must come to the end of that thing of I'm protecting myself, I'm keeping my own life. Because once we do that, we are disqualifying ourselves. Joseph of Arimathea, who went to request for the body of Jesus, and Nicodemus, who came with all the myrrh and everything that was needed for the burial of Christ. Both of these people were on the council, but they disagreed with the decision to put Jesus to death. And up to this point, these two were secret disciples. They had not come out clearly that they're disciples, but when it really mattered, Joseph and Nicodemus stepped up. They came out of hiding and gave the Lord Jesus a befitting burial. And the question again is, where were the disciples who walked with him before? It is the secret disciples who stepped forward. My prayer is that when, you know, push comes to shove and the, the rubber hits the road, that you and I will not disappear from standing up for Jesus. That it's not going to be some secret disciples who come out that day, but that you and I who have been going to church publicly, sharing the word publicly, may the Lord give us that grace to stand with him even up to the last hour. May God give us the grace not to be like the disciples who disappeared. May we not be slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus rebuked his disciples in Luke 24, 25 for being slow of heart to believe what the prophets have said. May we not be slow of heart. May we believe everything we read in the word of God. And may we not shy away from God. Anytime we feel ourselves beginning to stray, may we quickly repent and not harden our hearts. I'm going to end here tonight with that, um, you know, call to reflection to say, please, let us not just um, be those Christians who will be fair weather Christians. But when the challenges come, when our Lord Jesus is being maligned, ill spoken of, that we'll be able to step forward. We will not go into hiding. It will not be the secret disciples who come out whilst we who were known to serve Jesus have gone into hiding. May the Lord help us to continually respond to the Holy Spirit so that our hearts will not become hardened. Amen. I'm going to stop here tonight. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything to add on. If you do, please do go ahead. <laughs>